we've all heard the question, will you teach my child to read before kindergarten? But as parents and educators, we probably should be asking a different question. Not so much, can my child learn to read before kinder or how can we do it? But perhaps instead, how can I instill a love of learning in my children and students? How can I help them be excited to learn to read, be excited to want to read? That's the topic of conversation today, how to build emergent literacy. Welcome back to the Preschool All-Stars podcast. I'm your host, Joy Anderson, and with me today is my good friend, Vanessa Levin. Not only has she taught in the district for over 20 years, she has also devoted her life to this beautiful pre-K pages. And if you've been around the preschool world for any time, you know Vanessa with pre-K pages. She has also spoken at over 100 conferences, including our beloved NAEYC conference. And she also just wrote a book called Teach Smarter. Welcome to the podcast, Vanessa. Hey, Joy. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Ever since I started my preschool in 2008, we have just been following you for so long because I love pre-K pages and everything you do. So before we talk about emergent literacy, can we go back to the day? Like, where did this entire journey begin? Well, that's an interesting question, Joy, because it really just started out as a website. This is back before blogs even existed. It was a website because my school district, my public school district required all teachers to create a website and they tied it into our teacher evaluation. And so I'm type A and (laughs) I'm a perfectionist. And so I wanted to get my website done before the first day of school. Uh, because we all know teaching little children is very exhausting. So uh, I created it on my own and no parent ever visited it. (laughs) But it turns out a lot of teachers found it. And so it just took off from there. It was a surprise to me. Um, (laughs) But back at that at that time frame, it was around 2001, 2000, 2001. It just took off and it has become its own thing. And I am just so thrilled and honored to be on the ride (laughs) and also to be here chatting with you. So yeah. And to think that this all started because your district asked you to create a website. (laughs) That's crazy. Yes, it was. It was quite a shock to me. (laughs) Now you've been teaching for over 20 years. So what grades have you taught? So I spent almost all of my time, my 20 years in public education, I spent almost all of that time in pre-kindergarten because in the state of Texas, we offer pre-kindergarten to children who qualify. Uh, I did do a couple years here and there in kindergarten when our numbers weren't enough. Mm -hmm. Um, But my true passion is working with second language learners who are in pre-kindergarten. So that's four years old. Oh, I love that. And so With the experience that you have and being able to grow this into an amazing following that you've created, let's talk about this book. You just wrote this book, Teach Smarter. So what is the premise of this book? So the whole book came about because back in the early 2000s, my district was really pushing. We had a new curriculum coming out, right? We get this public school districts get to choose the curriculum they're going to quote unquote adopt, which has always seemed like a very weird phrasing to me. Um, And they were pushing for a curriculum that I knew wasn't going to work for my students. And it was a curriculum that promoted one letter a day. And so being, you know, a website in its infancy, I just wrote about it. I just wrote about my feelings and why I didn't feel it would work for my kids and possibly what was better in my opinion and who who knew that those words I wrote in the early 2000s would turn into a book 20 <laughs> years later um, because it just gained lots of traction on the internet and it actually became like the number one way that people find me. Wow. Um, so when it was time to write a book, um, when a publisher approached me, they said, what's the one book that you would like to write you think would be a no brainer? And I was like, Oh, I know the topic, early literacy (laughs) and teaching the alphabet and teaching children how to read. And so that's kind of where the whole thing came from. And so the book Teach Smarter Literacy Strategies for Early Childhood Teachers is all about what it takes to create a strong foundation so a child can become a reader. So it's not 
how to teach your child to read a apple ah. <laughs> um, it's more about what are all the skills that go into that um, and so that's what we focus on in teach smarter that's amazing I think a lot of times we go into the we kind of maybe jump over some of the foundational stuff and we go straight to okay well for teaching uh you know reading and such okay let's go to the vowel sounds and let's go to all the consonant sounds and all that great stuff and blends but let's back up and let's talk about that foundation. I think that's where your meaning is. This is the foundation that we need to discuss. And I'm sure that stuff is also very important, but there's other things that are incredibly important as well. Exactly. Love that. And I think this is a question that <laughs> over and over again, and, and truly when I'm doing tours with our preschool or um, especially as parents, you know, when is my child supposed to learn to read? Uh, is that kindergarten? Is it pre-K? Like, where do we? And then we've got, of course, Many, many companies that teach, oh, we can get your child to read at three um, or even, you know, uh, private school programs. You know, your child will learn to read at three. I think we know that. Challenger school. <laughs> Anyways, um, but when that question comes up, can you teach my child to read? And it, we really have to go back to let's talk about the foundation. So let's go into that. Tell us about some of the foundational things that we need to be making sure our students and our children are instilling in these formative years. Um, to build upon that eventual reading journey. Absolutely. So the book is basically uh, four different sections, and each section is um, one of those foundational skills. So the first section is all about phonological awareness skills, and it includes some of what you were talking about, about the letter sounds and the blends and all that. But it's actually a much broader um, area than I think a lot of people assume. It's more than just uh, letter sounds. So we talk about that, that whole umbrella, as well as practical strategies to apply in the classroom, things that are hands-on um, and that are developmentally appropriate ways to teach these skills. And then we move into concepts of print, um, which seems for a lot of people just to be like, well, we already exposed them to print in the classroom, but it's really, again, much more complex than that. And it's also something really easy for teachers to do. You know, it's not a whole separate thing they have to do. It's actually something you can infuse into your classroom. So that makes that step a lot easier. And then, of course, there's the be all end all of reading, right? Letter knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> right? When are they going to learn their letters? How should they learn their letters? And so we really delve deeply into that because I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about how children actually learn letters. Like, what is the process? How does a child go from not knowing any letters to knowing that this shape, a triangle kind of with a line through it, means the letter A? And that there's also another shape that means A, and that's a circle. <laughs> with a like, that's a very, very complex process. As adults, it may seem very easy to us because we already know how to read. So how do you teach that to little children um, who may or may not have any prior exposure to this whole concept that these shapes have names. And so that we take a lot of time in the book to talk about that and how children actually learn these skills based on the brain research. And then the last piece is oral language, which a lot of people tend to just skip over because they're like, well, my kids talk, so we're good there. <laughs> but actually, there's some really intentional things you can do that don't take a lot of prep or time. It's just being conscious and aware and being purposeful in how you provide them the opportunities to develop that oral language. So we really break it down into very actionable steps for teachers. And I'm really excited about the book and I hope you and your readers are too. Oh, 100%. We're going to all need that link at the very end. Of course, I'm sure it'll be very easy to find. But let's dive in now. After you talked about those four core components that truly are the heart of learning to uh, be able to read. Let, can we get some actual strategies that we could use as parents or educators in our classrooms for each of those four? So could we go back to the phonological one? Sure, absolutely. And sometimes uh, one of the things I like to do is to let teachers know that a lot of what you're already doing applies to these four basic strategies, right? We don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We just have to be aware of the things that we are already doing in our classrooms on a daily basis and how these can influence uh, a child's uh, reading readiness. So by being very intentional and saying, oh, you know, I do that quite often. Maybe I can just do it a little more, you know, and one of those very basic skills when it comes to phonological awareness, developing those skills 
is reading books that rhyme. I mean, I think we can all tick that box, right, Joy? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I can name five right now. (laughs) Right. So when we read books that rhyme, we're exposing children to the rhythm and the repetition that occur in the English language. And the more opportunities they have to listen to rhyming books, the more their brains are well uh, conditioned to receive that information when it comes to the time later when they're actually building those physical reading skills, if you will. So that is really just being very intentional about the books that you read that are rhyming. So, you know, you try to find really engaging, fun books, right, to spice up your read aloud time. And so we just want to make sure that we are consistently reading. And not every book you read needs to be rhyming either. (laughs) That would be a a bit of a challenge. I think I'd run out of books after the first hundred days. (laughs) But, you know, just be intentional and trying to find the highest quality, the most engaging picture books with vibrant pictures that rhyme. You know, things like Llama Llama Red Pajama, right? That's one we can all get on board behind. That's a (laughs) really good book. You know, and that doesn't mean you don't have to read great books like Jan Brett's Gingerbread Baby. You still want to do that too, because that teaches a whole other skill. But reading books that rhyme, that's a very, very easy one. And then calling attention to the rhyme in that book. You know, maybe not every page, not every rhyming word, that would take forever. We know their attention spans couldn't handle that. But every now and again, letting your voice go silent at the end of a line and the children chime in. (laughs) <laughs> like that is so powerful. And I think that that is um, something very intentional that we're, a lot of us are already doing that we can do more of to create that strong foundation. And then, of course, you get into the letter sounds and you get into the blends. There's also syllables and things like that that a lot of people don't think of when it comes to reading, right? We don't always say, well, I need to teach syllables now. You know, and syllables are just the sounds we hear in words like mama, right? Mama right? There's two syllables in that. And and you can do that so easily by just every now and again, clapping a few words. I like that the way that sounds. Mama, llama. Let's clap mama. Mama. So easy. And it took what? A couple of seconds? (laughs) Just putting that in there every now and again, to just plant that seed that these words have parts, you know? Um, little super simple, easy things like that. And the great thing about phonological awareness joy is that it's all auditory. So you don't need a bunch of stuff, right? It's all with, with their ears. It's all done with their ears. So that's what's great about phonological awareness. Yeah, we can all love that statement that it doesn't require a lot of stuff. And you're probably already doing a lot of this already. But you can just know, okay, these are the things that I'm already doing, but maybe I can more emphasize the syllables or or make sure there's a few more of these rhyming books. So just being aware that you're already doing a good job and having more intention behind the things you're doing. I love that. Let's go into print, the second one. Yes. So concepts of print is another really, really easy one. So let's say you're already reading all these great rhyming books, right? Now, let's make sure that our students that are in our classrooms um, or our children have access to those really engaging rhyming books that they know and love. For example, again, Mama Llama, uh, Llama Llama Red Pajama, sorry. (laughs) There's a lot of rhyming words in there. Um, Making sure that they have a copy of that in their reading area so that they can then mimic those reading behaviors, right? A lot of us know that our own children and sometimes our students will pick up a book and pretend to read it. And that's really half the battle. Like once you get to that point, you're you're on the right track. So if you see your kids doing that, turning pages, pointing to pictures and words, that means you're doing something right and that should be celebrated. Another thing that um, you can do is to uh, call attention to print in the world around them. So, you know, I think back to when I was a kid, my mom likes to tell this story um, and I'm not sure what it says about me, but my (laughs) first words as a child were French fry (laughs) because every time I saw the golden arches, I would point and say French fries. Mm -hmm. And that was actually, though though those were my first words and obviously oral language, it was also uh, environmental prints. That means the print that we see in the environment around us, right? So I was actually 
building a pre-reading skill at the age of, I don't know how, when I started to talk, but I'm going to say sometime under the age of two. <laughs> um, so little things like that. And you can bring that environmental print into your classroom so easily by just looking in your recycling bin, right? Your cereal boxes, um, the packaging that you have uh, from things that you've bought at the grocery store. You can take that packaging into your classroom and you can do really simple things. So it's free, first of all, right? That's the best thing about <laughs> environmental print. <laughs> we we early childhood teachers like free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you grade your recycling bin, you get some of these um, boxes and things like that, that, that you, you're going to set up for recycling. You take those fronts of the boxes into your classroom and you can actually make puzzles with them, matching games. You can put them in your block center and your dramatic play center and just really get those concepts of print in there into the room. And so super, super easy to develop concepts of print with young children, just being intentional and thinking, you know, consciously that you're going to be doing these things. So super easy. I love all these strategies. They are just one step further than perhaps exactly where we're at right now. Just, oh, yes, I can do that. It very simple, easy to do strategies that we can do as parents or as educators. This is beautiful. Okay, let's move into that third area. So letter knowledge, and this is the big one, right? This is the this is the <laughs> one where everyone wants to know, how do I teach my kids those letters? Because that really makes parents feel, you know, like their kids are learning something when they go from not knowing all their letters to knowing all their letters or some of their letters. That gives parents a sense of, okay, I'm this is the right decision for me and my child, right? So letter knowledge is actually the definition of it is when we look at it, it's really more basic and it really gives us as educators um, a feeling of accomplishment when we think about it this way. And the definition of letter knowledge or letter identification, if you will, is letters have shapes and those shapes have names, right? So for example, you might show a child the letter, oh, let's say for example, the letter F. And they might say, this is very common in this day and age, Joy, they might say Facebook. <laughs> That's so funny because I think back when I was uh, doing all of my teaching, of course, I hired teachers after that, but that was not a conversation I was having. But so interesting that in the classrooms right now, they're recognizing that as Facebook. So many kids um, recognize the F as Facebook because it's an <laughs> app, right? The app has an F on it. So you and I both know that that letter name of that letter is not Facebook, but that child has identified that image, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And they've attached meaning to it. So the child knows that the letter has a shape yeah. and that the shape has a name. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they didn't get was the correct name. So they were two thirds of the way mm -hmm. to letter knowledge on that particular letter. And so I think once teachers see that it's a process that takes place over time, it becomes less daunting, if you will. Because I know back in the beginning, I would, because assessment's a big part of public schools, I would assess my kids and I would feel really defeated when I showed them a letter and they said something like, you know, something that completely off the wall, like dog. <laughs> yeah, it, yep. it wasn't the letter D that I just showed them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they recognized that it had a shape, right? And they just didn't give it the right name. Um, and maybe they were thinking about the dogs that they draw on paper. You know, you never know what goes on in a child's mind. Absolutely. <laughs> but not discounting that as a failure, right? You know, not thinking that's a failure. And I'm, I have so much work to do thinking, okay, I've got some work to do and I know where that work needs to start. And so, and, and one of the ways you do that is by visual discrimination. That means children matching shapes, right? So think about the way we match the shapes in the world. You know, you can have children match the silhouettes of things. So a lot of those silhouette matching things, that's really a visual discrimination skill and an early literacy skill. So if you've got anything like that going on in your classroom, you can tick that box off and go, okay, we're working on a visual <laughs> discrimination. You know, so very simple things that we are probably already doing to promote uh, letter identification and knowledge skills in our classrooms on a daily basis so that if anyone did come in and say, what are you doing to teach my child to read? You could say, <laughs> here's what I'm doing. And these are how all these things lead into reading. I'm creating that foundation. 
I love that. And I think so often as teachers, we might not have the words to use with these parents because they come secondhand knowledge to us. Like we do them day in, day out, but actually identifying, yes, we have like, you know, from Vanessa's book, right? Our four core things. This is how I'm helping your child to learn um, this reading skill and being able to have the words behind what we already do day in, day out is so beneficial. So I love that. Now let's move into our now, our fourth and final, not perhaps final because we can never put everything in a box, but a wonderful skill, our fourth skill. That would be oral language. And like I said, this one gets swept under the rug quite a bit because we think, well, I don't have any issues with oral language because my kids talk too much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But what in fact, if you're just intentional about the opportunities that you give children to talk freely in your classroom, and that doesn't mean you're trying to read a book and they just talk all over you. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about that time when the children can interact with their peers and talk to each other. So we know as early childhood educators that that time is called center time, right? (laughs) So I'm sure that most all of us have that kind of time, a free play, right? In our classrooms. So we just need to think intentionally about how we're offering those opportunities for children to talk to each other in an unstructured environment, right? And also the length of time that we offer them those opportunities. So that would just be making sure that you have a nice chunk of time every day, like an hour of free play if possible, so that they can just talk to each other. Because the research shows that the more children talk peer to peer or child to child, the greater the strength of their oral language skills are. Because when we talk to them in the teacher-child way, right, in the the formal instructional way, you know, like, does anyone know what this is? Oh, yes, this is a dump truck. You know, it's not um, a natural speaking pattern for them. It's just a, a question that they're answering. It's not actual conversational skills is what I'm getting at. So just being very intentional about the opportunities that you offer and then enhancing those opportunities, right? So if we have center time, how can we make sure that the language that they're using, the oral language that they're using is elevated, right? How can we, how can we make it so that they're incorporating the words that they're learning at school, that academic vocabulary, that they're naturally including it into their conversations because that's how they really learn it. And You can do that very simply by creating a print rich environment, you know, labeling everything. Of course, we're all about the labels in early (laughs) days. Labeling everything and then maybe providing some additional like vocabulary picture cards that you put out in intentional places throughout the room and then also call their attention to every now and again. Like they're playing in the dramatic play center and they're using the cash register, right? As they love to do. They love to push that button. And Absolutely. Stuffing, stuffing the little the door. <laughs> yes. And they might not know that that's called a cash register. So mm. if you have your little vocabulary chart there, you can say, oh, I see that you love the cash register. I like pushing that button and listening to it go ding too. Uh, what are you doing with your cash register? Something like that. Just bringing it to another level, bringing it to their attention. And that is, it's as simple as that, honestly. And creating a print rich environment. And I love that you mentioned having vocabulary cards all around your classroom. I never thought about doing that. I mean, we labeled everything, uh, but actual, you know, cards that could be in every different center. I absolutely love that. So, I mean, kiddos, you know what they love to do, right? And they even would probably be reading those similar to like what they would call reading a book, right? Where I could just see them coming, sitting down at at that couch with their friend and like going through and talking about each one. Oh, I have one of those at home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. Now you've got this amazing book here. And of course, the creator of pre-K pages for so long and all of this uh, wealth of knowledge. Our listeners are going to want to have this book in their hands. (laughs) Every, Every parent, every teacher is going to need it so that they can be able to help their students and children develop this emergent literacy and and love of learning and reading. So where can we get a copy of your book and follow you? So the best place to get a copy of the book is Amazon (laughs) or any other of your favorite online booksellers. Um, And if you want to get in touch with me or if you want to see what I have out there, we've got um, 20 years of blog posts at Pre-K Pages. I think it's close to 3,500 blog posts. Oh my goodness. Uh, Wow. If you want to take a peek, uh, go over to pre-kpages.com 
And we've got it all sectioned off for you into categories like dramatic play and learning centers and so forth. So it should be easy to find what you're looking for. Go over there. And then if you want to visit us on any of our social channels, you can also do that right there on the blog. This has been a wealth of knowledge. Thank you much, so much for sharing. Now, everyone, go over to Amazon, grab a copy of her book, Teach Smarter. And as well, go to pre-kpages.com to be able to follow her website and find her on all of her social channels. Again, Vanessa, thank you so much for being on our podcast. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Joy. If you love today's episode, then you are going to love this. I want to give you a free gift in your hands. This is a copy of my book, Start Your Preschool, and I want to get it to you for free. Yes, I said for free. It is a 300-page book. It'll help you learn the step-by-step process to actually starting your local or your online preschool. Every single step that I walked myself through, as well as the thousands of women who's created their own successful preschools have gone through the exact steps listed in this book. Not to mention, I also share 20 amazing women's stories. So as you can see how not only did it work for me, but it works for amazing women just like you as well. I want to get you this free copy. Just go to freepreschoolbook.com or click the link in the description and we'll get it to you today. Again, just go to freepreschoolbook.com and we'll get it right to you. 